Hello, world weavers, and welcome back to another episode of the Atlas Loom, an exploration of world building for tabletop and beyond. I am Diana Fay, one of your two lovely hosts, the other of which is Endeavorance, a man whose brain cells, if you laid them side by side in a line, would stretch from here to Louisiana, and you can decide if that's a good thing or not. I'm fairly certain down? that's a bad thing. I'm fairly certain. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to think about it. And there's that whole thing where it's like if you were to take what, like every cell in your body or whatever, it's supposed to like go out to the moon and back. Um, right. I strongly <laughs> believe that Louisiana <laughs> is closer to me than the moon. And that makes me think that's a matter of like how much, what portion of your, of your body is brain matter and what? How how much of that would actually reach to Louisiana compared to the moon? Is Louisiana I, on the moon? Is my question. Um, no, but in your world it can be. Hell audience. yeah! Welcome to the Atlas <laughs> Welcome Loom, back. a world building podcast <laughs> with Louisiana on the moon. What a good hold on. Wait, zero gravity gumbo is one a really great name <laughs> for a one shot, and two a really <laughs> great for premise anything. for a one shot. Imagine, this imagine like moon based gumbo. gumbo, right? Where it's like, oh a, it's God. like a bunch of like astronaut. Wait, it's like a like a moon base, but everything is like Creole <laughs> themed. <laughs> this is I just like this. a restaurant theme. Honestly, I, you can yeah. do this. You can start this. Oh, that's a great idea. Isn't also like when you have liquids and stuff in zero gravity, don't they just form like balls? Yeah, like globules. Yeah. So like you, so you can just have, like stick a straw into <laughs> You just have the the ball of rice and then broth around it. Shit. It's perfect. Oh my Shit. goodness. All, All right, right, we're pivoting. This is forget now this a, podcast. Yeah. Let's uh let's dissolve the Atlas Loom. You know. We'll start well, a restaurant. I think what you meant to say was let's boil it down. That wasn't very good. Now Welcome I'm to the Atlas leaving. Loom. We're not known for our jokes. Diana, no. um, I'd say one of my favorite factions in, in the real world is Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's talk about factions. That was such a strong intro. That was a great segue. I did it. Man, we really should stop this podcast just right here and there. I think we're done. <laughs> yeah, because we've peaked, obviously. But yeah, this this episode's all about factions. If you want to, I mean, this is mostly your thing, Dev. Mm. Why? Hold on. Well, hold on. Just threw me out in front of a well, uh, entire to... bus lane. Sounds good. <laughs> um, I Cause... like factions. I'm a faction boy. I, I'm looking over here in the notes of my of my wonderful co-host, uh, who wrote essentially "fuck <laughs> this." Uh, um, and, yeah, it's my first point. <laughs> yeah, literally the first bullet point says "concede to Dev," which is. The only time that I think Diana will ever write those words. Um, oh, yeah. So I'm cherishing it. it. Clip that. Uh, so she says, concede to Dev, hate factions, mostly because I hate politics and games. Yeah. Um, I want to start <laughs> there, I think. <laughs> We're going to unpack that? <laughs> let's unpack. Let's, let's oh, talk. No. Hold on. Where's, where's Gina with, the, with, the, with a pen oh, to click? Jesus. Um, By the way, if you don't know our friend Gina, we have an episode where we talk about how do you make really good player characters with probably one of the best role players that I know. So go check that out. Anyway, I do hate factions and I do hate politics and games. Like the whole... I don't know. I, I've been invited to like actual plays and things like that where people are like, oh, yeah, you know, most of it is like rivalry between kingdoms or like you're working for this faction to undermine this other faction. But there's like this leader that you absolutely hate, but you have to use like espionage and like you have to manipulate people. And it's just I don't I'd rather fight a dragon is all. That being said, factions are an irrevocable part of any world, really. Anything that has society is going to have factions because the definition of faction is pretty loose. You know, I think that there's a lot that doesn't like you said, like it doesn't have to be espionage and, uh, you know, religious comp competition and whatnot. Like in this episode, I want to refer to factions as literally any coalition of people. Yeah. And and it can be a guild. It can be a clan. It can be a religion. It can be a cult. It's really just any group of people who are aligned under some sort of combined goal or leadership. Such as a series of podcast listeners named World Weavers. Hey! Get your merch today to become an official World Weaver and join our faction slash cult slash coalition. Perfect. <laughs> Honestly. By the way, speaking of which, for those who are watching the video version, uh, plug in the merch. 
don't i mean okay. don't use that to plug the merch that's this our worst is, merch yeah that's our just... ironic merch <laughs> that's our merch that we have when we want to joke about the fact that we have merch i am like wearing... it looks good but it's it looks good through a frosted glass window from a thousand meters is i'm how wearing it looks. our our world weaver knit sweater asterisk which looks asterisk. like dump in person uh but it's still very cozy and yeah. technically is a knit sweater so <laughs> Deb wears it so much during his streams and stuff that I've worn it's like it once. I've seen it several times. I feel like I've worn wrong. it twice. I, it's a good. I mean, look. I mean, if, if if you don't, if the sweater doesn't convince you, at the very least, you guys have to check out the store to read the fucking descriptions of the shit that Deb put on there. He literally he messaged me at one point and he's like, his exact words were, "You have no choice but to look on an abject horror while I write the descriptions for Atlas Loop merch." And he delivered. My God, the descriptions are fucking hilarious and also just mildly unhinged. <laughs> I don't know how to write product descriptions. And like, what, am I, great. To, what am I supposed to fucking say about like, this is a cup. <laughs> like, uh, it's, a, it's a cup. It is. Liquid go in. Sometimes. Cups, tote bags, shitty sweaters, actual good sweaters, t-shirts, and a throw blanket that I'm waiting on. Um, so check so that probably. out. We were supposed to plug that at the end, but I don't give a shit. No, I, I'm going to plug it here. We don't do ads so <laughs> far, and this is how we can be supported by our lovely community. Either this yeah. or subscriptions on the atlasloom.com. It super helps us. It lets us make stuff, and we've got a lot of plans in store. So to make those plans yeah. become a reality, uh, you can head to shop.endeavorance.camp or theatlasloom.com, and you can buy merch. Get subscriptions, support us, get bonus content. It's a great time. Let's do the episode now. Yeah, factions, right? Factions. They're I, I love them. I, I, I they're one of my favorite things to do in world building. Is I, I see them as an easier way to populate places. I don't see them as a. It's not the genesis of strife for me. I'm not making factions because I want to create strife and and politics and whatnot. I'm making factions because I love the idea of people who are just really into a thing working together to make that thing better and so mm -hmm. like one of my go-to things is to start with guilds so various merchant guilds or fighters guilds adventurer guilds anything like that where it's just sort of a support network and they're relatively decentralized or they're found sort of everywhere and that lets you get really quickly into just like what's their sigil what are they wearing like what's what do they do what services do they offer stuff like that and that's what i love the most about designing factions and everything else all of the the politics the squabbling the vying for power that's all downstream effects of the creation of other factions and figuring out those details and so that's why i love making factions is it it just I just get to make happy little groups doing doing happy their happy little, little thing and then sometimes killing each other a lot. Uh, occasionally. Yeah, I guess you could. And and then here in the Atlas Limb, especially for my part, I try and boil things down into like, here are questions you should ask yourself. Um, if you answer these, you'll have your thing, you know, making it stepwise, making it easy. And with factions, it's probably one of the easier ways to do it. It's very similar to how we handle religion and like deities back in our very... God, it was like our first, first episode. episode. Uh, so go watch that. We kind of touched on how you would build a religion by building out basically what you said, like symbols, people, things like that. Um, any advice we give here today applies to any organized group. And we're going to try and try and make it easy for you. I'm going to start, as I usually do, with an example of a, of a thing that got me into wanting factions and everything anyway, which would be the Elder Scrolls franchise that has. Ooh. They they love their factions there. They we, they're big on factions. I mean they they've got all the different guilds and and again, great place to start is just to take just the wholesale clone guilds from the from their world. You've got your assassins guild, your thieves guild, your your fighters guild, your um uh well, I guess the Skyrim, mage college. Yeah, the the mage college and Skyrim kind of like had the uh the, the, the vampire big one. Three. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, the, the Dawn Guard. And and then also in Skyrim, the fighters spoil spoiler for um the video game Sky that, that a pretty small indie game made by an indie mm -hmm. developer named uh Tadathy Howard. Um <laughs> Skyrim's Fighters Guild is also like secretly the werewolf guild, which is kind of rad. 
uh, yeah. and and almost made the Fighters Guild redeemable in Skyrim, but still not not the, not the the best plot line. Getting off, yeah. to, I could Scarlet I could Brotherhood do was way cooler. an entire second podcast criticizing what kind of game Skyrim could have been if they did more with it. Um, <laughs> It, that's I'm what mods not, are for yeah that's what sitting around and spending 300 hours on vortex and nexus is uh is for i and yeah, not actually you spend 300 hours on on nexus and then you launch the game and you're like but it's still skyrim and so then you go do something else yeah uh, yep. no it's really pretty now yeah but my god i don't if i hear the name fucking rorikstead again i'm gonna <laughs> rorikstead i'm from rorikstead <laughs> hey you jesus um <laughs> yeah Picking just some some the the big boy factions, right? The big boy guilds that are your uh, the the presences of these features of society, the 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 underbelly of society, the protectors of society, the the learned ones. Those are your your big faction directions. From there, I will usually try to break pieces out and either have sub factions that are working together and aligned, or one of my other favorites factions that have broken out because of a falling out or misalignment of values from an original faction. Maybe there's the Assassin's Guild and there is an argument among leadership about what kind of contracts they are willing to take. Maybe one oh. is no holds barred. We take all contracts. It does not matter. Morality doesn't apply here. We are an Assassin's Guild. We are doing business. Maybe another one says, like, we will not get involved in uh, a ruling class that is trying to squash opposition or something like that. And so they've got, like, a moral dilemma there of, yeah, I kill people, but I kill people the right way. I kill the right people. You can have them break off, and suddenly you've got two rival guilds that may, one, be vying for those contracts, and two, trying to rid the world of each other's existence. I love factions. I fucking love factions. They're so much fun. It's taking all my effort not to go into the John Wick universe again. Go ahead. Dip in. No, Let's I do don't it. want you to. It's taking I up talk so much about... fucking airtime on this goddamn <laughs> podcast. I can't. They should be paying us. They should be paying. John John Wick uh, himself. Keanu yeah. Reeves should be. When are we having him on the podcast? Next week. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Bonus episode. Be sure to sign up. <laughs> Theatlessloom.com. No, don't promise that. Uh, yes, we can. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> well, okay, but here's the thing is Keanu Reeves, like, he's the kind of guy that if we just made that announcement, I wouldn't put it past him to just find his way into the studio and be like, yeah, you said I was going to be here, so I'm here. The studio. The studio. That's My apartment. <laughs> anyway, when you build a faction, what do you start with? Name? Goal? Location? Definitely not name. Um, I like to come up with a name once I've got the foundations in place. I usually start with their purview what do they purview. what do they care about what do they hold dear and what are they bringing to the world um i'm going to dip into my favorite one if you're not going to touch john wick then i'm going to go hard into blades because uh, blades yeah. the dark is all about factions and and maybe that's why i like blades but basically in the in the default setting of blades in the dark Literally everything is a gang, more or less. Like even the government is considered one, and like the guards are considered one. Basically, every every group is a faction that has alliances and enemies, and there's a big matrix basically of who likes who and who hates who. As you play, you gain and lose favor with these various groups and if you go low enough, there's like a score that I think goes from like negative four to four, I think, where like oh. four is your absolute besties and negative four is it is kill on sight if they catch you. There's factions for everything in that game, ranging from the dock workers, like essentially things that would be like unions, like dock workers are a faction. There's the lamp lighters are a faction. There's other stuff like the people who are are you know doing weird cult shit with like <laughs> ghosts like that's a faction too but then the mundane stuff your your guards your government um like the, the aristocratic factions more or less basically ruling class is also a faction there and also has that same mechanic of relationships between factions i adore the 
reputation system that they have in that game, especially because of the network effect, where you've got a faction that has an alliance that you are maybe out like at war with what uh, with a faction another faction is allied with. And now mm-hmm. there's this conundrum of, are you at war with every faction that's allied with that faction or just that one and you're able to finagle your way into still having an alliance with another, but you're causing that other faction to strain their relationship with the one that hates you. And now we're getting into probably what you hate, the politics and whatnot, but it that strife sets up so many great scenarios and so many tense moments. And it also can just lead to breaking apart these fra- these factions and creating rifts, like I had already said, like disagreements from within the faction causing a, a, break- a breakup that creates two new factions. Yeah. I mean, you touched on a lot of really good stuff there. Um, so, and we'll get back to the whole, like, source of, like, you know, obviously you start with the, the goal and things like that. But you mentioned a reputation system, which a lot of games have by default, you know. Um, D&D, you have a positive reputation system, but not every game thinks to have that negative one that you mentioned where it can go into this other faction hates you equally on the same scale at the same rate as this other faction loves you. So yeah. trying to keep that both the positive and negative in mind. Um Really breaking it down into a point system, I wouldn't go as shallow as, like, four points. I would even have it to be, like, the same way that, um, I think it's piety. There's, like, a piety system in Mythic Odysseys of Theros, or Theros, however it's pronounced in D&D, where your points can go to, like, 120, you know, on a granular scale. And every quest you complete on behalf of your faction uh, raises or lowers by a certain point number, you know, could be worth 10 points, could be worth 15, something like that. Um, so I'd get a little more granular than that. But um, I always like to think of like the infamous scale, you know, that old PlayStation game where you have like red power versus blue power, depending on if you're good or bad and the moral choices you make. God, that I, I love that concept for that game. I know the game itself wasn't actually good, but still. Um, I mean, yeah, like thinking a, of it that way. Uh, Mass Effect also had that. They had the, the Paragon versus, I forget what the opposite of Paragon was. But yeah, a similar like morality slider there. Yeah. Um, um. So you had that. You had the idea that your faction should always have allies and enemies. Um, so kind of planning around that. I wouldn't, I mean, having like a whole network and a whole chart of like, this person likes this person, but they don't like this person. It makes sense. I wouldn't say you need to get that granular if you don't want to, even just having like one or two allies and then enemies in mind, but also keeping in mind why they're allied with that group and why they're enemies with that group. Like, is it a historical, like full on this enemy group like destroyed one of our bases last week and now we're at war with them or is it like oh yeah the two factions are just controlled by twins and they hate each other and they're trying to outdo each other and that's why they're enemies um so thinking of a reason for that as opposed to just being like yeah we hate you for the sake of hating you um same with allyships you know maybe the guilds that runs the hospitality services in a certain part of your country are allied with the merchants guilds because they are it's beneficial for supply and things like that Uh, So just like a quick one or two reasons getting that jotted down. Amazing and really helps flesh out your world. There was one other point that you made that I wanted to touch on, but I cannot for the life of me remember what it was. I I forget every word that I've said the second that I've said it. Perfect. (laughs) So you mentioned the negative four to four scale. I agree that there's definitely room for more granularity and like whatever scale you want to use, you should use. Don't limit yourself to Literally, you can change the rules to whatever. Um, yeah. I really like the negative four to four scale because each one of those is like a step. And each, it, it kind of just lets you give each number a definition where, you know, zero is I don't care. Positive one is you seem cool. Positive two would be like, I'm keeping tabs on you. Three would be like, let's like we're, we're working together. Like I I've got your back. And four would be like, you were my blood. And on the opposite, like you've got, you know, just the inverse of that. Each step is just like, I hate you. I hate you more. I super hate you. I'm going to fucking kill you. And the, I mean, that's a (laughs) bit of an overview. (laughs) Having those large steps, I find makes it easier from a running the story perspective to glance at the number and know exactly how it should be going. Having a big range, while that gives you really good uh, granularity, 
in the moment, it's a little bit harder to look at, you know, two factions, large numbers and know exactly like what a 32 versus a 41 is going to be. And compared to a, you know, glance over zero in my notes or glance down four in my notes, you know, it's quick, accessible information that defines that relationship very clearly. That's a good point. I will also say, though, I guess it also depends on how granular you want to get with what you want your party member to gain at each of those levels. Mm -hmm. Because, like, it's one thing to say, and and you can do this if you want to, to just say, like, oh, you're at level one. We're friends now. Or you're at level two. Congrats. We trust you with some, some things. You have to know exactly what that person gains out of it like do you get access to more equipment you know a fence if it's a thieves guild or like access to nobility do you have new quests that you couldn't unlock before when you were at that level um do you have access to safe rooms can someone get you in and out of a city under the radar if you need to will someone bail you out of jail if you get stuck in jail um do they just straight up give you magic items and equipment and allies and henchmen you know do you get a full-on piece of property somewhere You know, especially if you think about it as like a political type thing or if the guild that you're working for is some sort of government entity, maybe you get granted a title and fucking titles are cool. Holy shit. We haven't talked about titles, dude. Having a cool title. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. That's something everyone should do in their game because like. Right. Being called fucking Arafine Lyadel is one thing in your fantasy game. That's a character I'm playing. But being called Arafine Destroyer of Worlds or like you know, conqueror of the Emerald Forest or something like that. Mm. So give your players fucking titles. They'll love it. It's a good time. It really is. And give... Here's the thing. I've been nerd sniped just by this entire episode and then also just like what you just said. But like, here's... Sorry. Here's a thing. (laughs) I didn't mean to steal your nerd. No, 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 no. It's fine. Uh, I... One of the things that I really like, and I, I run this in a lot of my campaigns, is having a. I want players to feel as though they can join a faction. I want I, this is why I like factions to be less. I like there to be plenty of factions that are approachable, that are not like an ethno state, right? That aren't just like a tribe or exclusionary, but are instead just a, a part of the world, like the fucking Boy Scouts or. <laughs> Like, like a thing <laughs> you can join, right? Speaking. I don't know why Boy Scouts is what came to my head, but <laughs> the the thing that I really like is, <laughs> I guess I guess I thought of Boy Scouts is because I like when you when I have a guild that players can join that have ranks with titles, mm-hmm. because it gives them a sub goal to be working towards, go up in rank and get that title, uh, and when they do go up in rank, it's like a secondary leveling system, and when they do go up in rank, yeah. they get to then present themselves as that title and it's kid in a candy shop like so cool so cool yeah they are they're like i I think one of them went from the the original the lowest title was like tenderfoot and then journeyman and one of them reached journeyman which was like really just you know nominal all right where you're now like actually officially in our ranks and he was like going around introducing himself as journeyman everywhere, yeah, and it's like because you're proud, you're showing off your little it. badge. All of the uh, all the like NPCs who like knew what that meant, they were just like, uh huh. <laughs> so there's no discount for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time having having those goals, having that sense of progression, like you're getting deeper into this organization as well. It feels good. It's progress. Any kind of like notable, meaningful progress that helps the player have more irons in the fire, basically, like more more contacts to reach out to more options available to them when they're making decisions. If they are now able to say like, well, I'm I'm a journeyman now. And so I'm afforded these these things from my guild. I can lean on that. Maybe like Mm -hmm. in again, like another nice thing in that Blades has is essentially hiring when you, when you get big enough, you can start hiring underlings to just go do tasks for you. And, like, you're doing your own thing, but, like, once you get some more notoriety and you have, a like, any kind of means, or if you have friends who have those means, you can essentially contract busy work. You can contract questing busy work out to those underlings, which may yeah. be provided by said guild. 
You can also, I mean, that kind of leads into tangentially the idea of downtime activities being related mm -hmm. to your guild. So maybe full on, if you're like doing a time skip in your game, your character might decide like, oh, okay, I'm going to spend all my time doing these little petty quests, or I'm going to help this specific character in this faction that I'm friends with, with whatever they're doing and be one of those henchmen. And slowly over the course of several weeks, you gain like, you know, a point a week of favor or something like that, just passively. Um, I will also say that gain in... And this is kind of tricky and it's kind of an advanced sort of thing, but maybe tangentially, or I keep saying tangentially, that's not the right word here, inadvertently gaining favor with a certain faction or losing favor with a certain faction just as a consequence of the quest that you're going on naturally. Like maybe you're not even part of a certain faction or religion or something, but some side effect of something you've done in the world is working either in their favor or against their favor. And so by the time you actually meet this faction, they know your name already. Or you could pull a fucking, like, they did this in Skyrim. The whole, like, you kill someone who the Assassin's Guild was supposed to kill. And you, like, stole their contract. And now they're contacting you and they're like, all right, well, you better come work for us. Or else we'll have to kill you too. <laughs> so kind of making it so those sorts of things happen in the background as well makes your world feel more real. Because you have ripples that come out as consequences of your player's actions. So kind of thinking about your faction's goals and then how things that are how, how things might be indirectly contributing or hindering those goals um, is a really good way forward i absolutely adore the example of the the dark brotherhood and skyrim the assassin's guild oh yeah that's what they're called what did i call them earlier scarlet brotherhood dark brotherhood that's the one the scarlet brotherhood welcome hey, sounds boys so much nicer they just chill they just have some tea i'll have bright red lipstick <laughs> If anybody wants to cosplay as a member of the Scarlet Brotherhood, uh, just do it. <laughs> I really like when factions have the rug pulled out from under them. I really like that example from Skyrim because it's it it when a faction has complete control over their purview. You know, I mentioned like the Merchants Guild or a Thieves Guild or whatever. When they are like essentially omnipotent in their mm -hmm. space, it's kind of boring. They, you want to yeah. have some sort of vulnerability because that gives one an in and two so many more plot hook options rather than just like this is a brick wall of a concept like these this fighters guild owns basically the entirety of the mercenaries in the world and there's nothing you can do about it. There's probably something you can do about it. Mercenaries like money and you can probably probably wedge a few wedges. We love in wedging wedges ranks. here at the Atlas We Lube. wedge wedges constantly. Why is a wedge of cheese just popped into my... Maybe because we're talking about Skyrim. Because we're talking about Skyrim. Jesus. <laughs> now I'm just thinking about uh, wedges of cheese. Dude, it is my life goal to just own a wheel of cheese at oh, some point. Yeah. Um, oh, I just, remember, just for the vibes. I don't remember where I read this. Maybe it was a TikTok. Maybe it was something. But I remember hearing a story about a girl who went on a date with a farmer boy and he brought a gift to her on their first date and it was a wheel of cheese. And Damn. Yeah. Nothing will ever compare. Holy mm -hmm. shit. New bar. Yeah. Is, is farm goods. Yes. Oh, I, like, fuck. Swoon. I would fuck. I would be so, if somebody brought me a wheel of cheese, <laughs> like, I don't fuck flowers. I don't want flowers. Bring me a wheel of cheese. One, yeah, that's just expensive. And two, it is. like, damn, about to make some mm -hmm. risotto? Holy shit. <laughs> Plus, like, I live alone. I will full on, like, midnight snack, just step out into my kitchen in my pajamas and just, like, munch on a wheel of cheese. Mm. Who the fuck is going to stop me? Mm. You know, like, I feel it's one of those primal pleasures that we in modern society have forgotten. We need to go back to our roots and eat more cheese. So like anyway, sorry like, to the lactose intolerant portion of our uh, of our audience here. <laughs> yeah, even just hearing about cheese makes them uh, sorry. gassy. I, I I I feel like eating a direct wheel of cheese is so like fun. the advanced version of just eating shredded cheese out of the back. But I'm now just picturing I'm I'm You're straight to the source. <laughs> we talked about we talked about um fan art earlier. I'm gonna need fan art now of Diana. Oh, just... <laughs> Just taking a giant bite out of a wheel of cheese. Please, that's like audience. Than her head. Oh, audience, make my dreams come true. <laughs> Jesus. Make my cheese come true. What were we talking about before all this? I have no fucking I factions. I think. Wedges. <laughs> Driving a wedge in 
a faction mm. dealing with the yeah, cheesemakers guild something like that the that. cheesemakers guild is the that's the they're the dangerous ones for realsies I I think another thing that I can crib from uh, Blades here on the topic of the Cheesemakers Guild, though, is guilds that formed for one purpose and became something completely different. That's oh. fun. And I believe so like the Lamplighters Guild in in Blades, I believe, is that I'm a little I'm a little rusty on all of my Blades factions, but I'm fairly certain that it was they started as literal Lamplighters and s- sort of slowly turned into, I think, Assassins. And it's sort of hush hush. Like they still do their job. Like they still light lamps and exist. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, they're not. Yeah, slacking. You can still see. Not an uh, asshole. Right. Yeah. They're just. A yeah, sense. they're not going to leave you in the dark. But they are. That's not really their purpose. They are. They are more than just a union of workers. They are doing things. They've got ulterior motives, and that can go for basically any faction. Like they don't have to just be a coalition of people doing good they can be a coalition of people who come together for a specific cause and then realize collectively there's a much better way to go about it and there's strength in numbers Mm -hmm. that's also the premise of just basically every good plot (laughs) yeah i just looked it up uh it's not the lamplighters they're called the lamplacks is the name of the of the faction in blades so don't uh don't at me i'm so sorry uh, they're the Lamplacks. They are like their story is that they were lamplighters, but then like electricity happened and they were basically uh. all out of a job. And so they turned to like underbelly work, like extortion and whatnot. So like that's they essentially nice. pivoted. Uh, and that's again, yeah, like they have a, a history that the, the lamp is still there. That That's like why that's they're named what they're named. But you have an organized group of people with a skill set uh, and and are very knowledgeable of all of the streets, specifically at night. And suddenly they're all out of a job. What happens to them? They become a new gang with a new purpose. Metamorphosis. We love it. Big words. I will say that does remind me of another point I had with regards to, I think, something that might actually be called the Lamplighters Guild or also a separate thing from a separate universe. I mean, Lamplighters is maybe... uh, just a fun term. At large, I would say. Um, Kind of getting into another point that you should think about when you consider a faction is how do they communicate with each other when they're not in the same room uh, across distances and then also across time? So the lamplighters that I'm thinking of that I've heard an example of at some point in time that I cannot remember where it came from uh, are a sect that will light or douse certain lamps in the city. Uh, depending on messages that they're trying to convey. So that's their secret code, is whether or not something is lit. Um, Taking that is a really good, very simple starting point for communication. You also have the concept of going back to Skyrim, for example, the Thieves' Guilds. They had those little marks and those symbols that they put around on different buildings and things like that that would let the player know, like, hey, there's a secret door here, or this person's wealthy, or this person's immune, stay away from them. Um, that in and of itself, not only does it work into things like your characters having some level of competency within the guild, so you can give them like a little cheat sheet that's like, hey, if you ever see this, here you go. Like you have this knowledge now, use it. Um, but also like if they come across one of those symbols randomly, they'll know like, oh my God, bonus area is here. Or, oh, we shouldn't do this quest anymore. My guild hates these pe- or like really is loves these people and is trying to protect them and they'll hate me if we take on this quest. Um, so kind of giving that player secret info that is related to their faction uh, membership is really cool. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Um, Druidic and Thieves Cant in D&D don't actually have rules surrounding them, but there's definitely a lot of supplements that people have made like homebrew versions of Thieves Cant and Druidic and things like that where you can actually translate sentences and give your players like a codex and have them again have that special info make them feel a little special there's also a concept that i saw online once about i think it had to do with a guild that was a mix of druids and rogues or some such guild that communicated through bouquets of flowers Mm. and they would send messages by putting different flowers into the bouquet and depending on you know different flowers had different meanings and depending on how many notches were cut into the stem or how many leaves I think were taken off, that would have certain meaning. How long the stem was had certain meaning, conveying different numbers and things like that. Um, so fucking cool. So kind of thinking about how people communicate with each other when they're not directly around each other is a good way to give your faction personality. I want to talk more about the Skyrim uh, Thieves Guild symbol thingies. Like, one, that's a real world thing. Like, that's based off of, like, 
actual groups in real worlds who in the real world maybe there's multiple we don't know uh who have come up with just like vague symbols to mean things like this is a safe space this is whatever i love that so much and i love having any kind of consistent tell of you like you know they're not putting it on display but if you know it when you see it you know it uh, yeah. to identify yourself as a member of something so especially with not super savory factions like factions that are not trying to be out in the public or if you're like a I don't know merchants guild that has some of them are in like a sort of inner circle or have connections to an underground market that is super super illegal but they need to identify which merchants are chill with doing that business and so maybe they'll have a specific sconce in their in their shop that mm. is like you know has some sort of filigree on it that if it's a certain swirling direction then yeah they they're a member and so you look for that and if you see it you know it uh, much less intense and hidden would just be artwork on the wall that is of either a portrait of someone or a specific, like a very specific castle or landscape that doesn't exist. And so there's no reason you would actually have it. And the only people who would have that exact painting are in the know. That's and, cool. Yeah. So you have you have no, you know, no suspecting person that would come through would see a painting of a castle and be like, that's suspicious. But if you know exactly what to look for, maybe that castle has a very specific flag that's a specific shape and color, then you know that's the correct real one. Definitely Ooh. did not steal that from Animal Crossing, of all places, where <laughs> it's not really? exactly how they use it. But in Animal Crossing, there is a shady art salesman. And whenever he's in town, he typically has like one like like multiple pieces of art oh. for sale and one is real and the rest are fake and yeah, they're all real world art things but you have to look for you have to identify the wrong versions of them so like the mona lisa might be like looking up to the side instead of straight ahead and like you have to just look at the painting itself to determine if it's real or fake fucking hilarious yeah but like that's where i got the inspiration for that <laughs> can come from anywhere yoinking the all-powerful tool Watch that episode, too, if you haven't. It's probably one of our more useful ones. <laughs> but hiding in plain sight at large is, is especially for factions that either don't want to be found or have a sort of secondary underbelly part of their faction that wants to remain at least somewhat anonymous. Super good. And merchants guilds also. There's so much room to play in merchants guilds. Merchants, merchants be shady. Or they're good, <laughs> but they can do some shady shit. Another reason that the factions might want to somewhat hide their existence is perhaps they, again, had a massive falling out. Perhaps there was they're the result of a faction that fractured and is now multiple factions, and one of them is almost entirely snuffed out, but is just trying to get by. Factions can fall apart, and often they don't completely get eradicated. They fall apart and just have just vestigial groups that are either trying to stay alive, trying to keep the dream alive, or just trying to archive that history so that it may happen again someday. It doesn't need to be that your faction is this big world-spanning group that's got eyes and ears everywhere, and you got to look for the signs. It really could just be we are the last hope of something that hasn't really been around for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but... This house, this house still believes. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of like global guilds and different sizes, uh, the size of your faction and the spread that they have, the reach that they have should also be something that you have nailed down. Um, probably one of the more concrete points that you should know when you build your faction, because it could be anything from something that operates within a very specific city that is trying to grow. Um, or maybe they're not, maybe they're just in that city for some particular reason, because that's where they're needed, um, to something that is regional, you know, operating in the western side of a country. Or maybe they're countrywide, or maybe they're continent-wide, or maybe they're global. Um, thinking about that will also implement uh, kind of like, it'll influence the way the hierarchy looks. Um, and I'm going to make this little triangle symbol here instinctually, because uh, it's more or less going to be a pyramid, Right. Kind of the same way trophic levels are, uh, you're going to want to make sure that however big your faction is, the biggest portion of it 
belongs to the grunts, the people who are the basic level trainees. For people um, who are not is, zoology majors, do you mind defining tropic levels? Oh, yeah. So the tropic pyramid is basically like a uh, it's it's how you describe energy flow and like energy distribution in an ecosystem. So like how if you think about the total amount of biomass that belongs to plants and then how many plants it takes to feed an herbivore, which means that, you know, for every let's say, I don't know, 10 billion blades of grass that feeds one cow. So you're going to have, instinct, like, by default, less cows than grass. And then grass. it takes a certain number of, you know, predators, like wolves, to eat, uh, you know, a certain number of cows to feed a certain number of wolves. And that's always going to be more cows are necessary to feed a wolf. So that third level is going to be even smaller than the number of cows. And then as far as whatever eats wolves, I don't know. What eats a wolf? Bigger wolves. It's going to be even less bigger wolves, even less apex <laughs> predators in a system. Um, a guild and basically any sort of group is going to be built the same way, where the most most of you people are going to be in that base level. Uh, slightly less of them are going to be at that second level that commands the first level or is slightly more experienced or is training them. The third level might have like all the intellectual leaders of your group, the people who hold all the lore, who are the... You know, the quest givers who are the quartermasters, things like that. Above that might be the people actually making decisions. And maybe there's only a handful of them for someone who's like for, for a group that's only regional. Um, and then, of course, maybe one leader. Now, if you're scaling it up to like a global scale, you're going to have thousands and thousands of people at that base level and then maybe like 50 leaders who are scattered across the globe. So kind of scaling up these amount of people in each of those levels based on how big the faction as a whole is. Because you don't necessarily have to have one leader. If you're on a global scale, you probably can't have one leader. You're probably going to have a coalition of several. Um, so that's a very important thing to think in, to keep in mind because your players are going to want to climb that ladder. And so knowing what that ladder looks like and who's there and how many people are at each level is something you should probably have written down somewhere. On the topic of leaders, well, for one, we should talk about leaders, but for two, yeah. each faction typically... And there's definitely leaderless factions. But as you're building these factions, alongside of them, building their leadership NPCs, very fun and also helps to shape the general just power dynamics in your world. My favorite faction in one of the worlds that I'm working on has three leaders. It's not one leader. It's three three people who are on the same level as each other. That opens up a lot of fun opportunities for largely either they can get along or one of them is going for a power grab or one of them sees themselves as the de facto leader of the leaders and that can spark deep fractures into the actual faction. Now, that's not happening in my story, but it can. It might. It depends. As I'm building out these factions, as I'm thinking about like, okay, like we've got the merchants, we've got the, the fighters, we've got the whoever, putting people at the heads of these factions, the easiest way to go about it, I would say, is just imagine what the epitome of that faction's goal is and make that person. If it is the fighters guild, their leader would be some big buff warrior lady who's just going to cleave everyone in half. But it doesn't need to be that way. And sometimes it's actually more interesting to think of why would somebody who is not a big buff warrior who has spent their entire life fighting be at the head of the Warriors Guild? Maybe they are a master tactician. And maybe suddenly you've got a Warriors Guild that, whereas most of the time you would just have to defeat them with blunt force, they're clever. Their, mm -hmm. their resources are being used extraordinarily well. That doesn't always work. You can't put some dumbass at the head of like a mage guild. Well, you can, but it probably wouldn't really work. <laughs> that brings me to another really good point. How did those leaders get there? You got to think about a plan for succession, you know, uh, especially, and it doesn't have to be set in stone. Like you can have a, a faction that, you know, when one leader dies, a new leader is consecrated through some ritual and that's how they gain their status. Or maybe the old leader has to be beat in a hand-to-hand -hand combat before the new leader can step in and take their place. And this faction is always infighting to, like, be that leader. Um, you can think of it that way. You can think about whether or not it's, like, you know, based around some family line. So when a leader dies, their son or daughter or other uh, 
child like steps in in their place by default and maybe that causes some strife or that's like a source of some quest somewhere thinking about how leadership turnover happens is a really good way to kind of breathe a little more life into your faction you're trying to hold back from john wick stuff i am now desperately holding back from destiny stuff so i'm <laughs> welcome back to the atlas loom a thinly uh, veiled john wick and destiny podcast it's a thinly, we should just make those it's a thinly veiled lance reddick fan podcast that's all this actually is. though yeah <laughs> the, the connecting line it's a thinly veiled the, welcome welcome to the, welcome to the reddick cast the reddick cast rest in peace fucking God. rip god damn it on the topic of leaders and talking about how do they get there what are they doing do they even deserve to be there I'm a big fan of leaders that are barely holding it together, uh, that Same. <laughs> that are not actually on top of shit and and relatable content. Yeah, like it's actually really fun when you go from when when your your idea of this group is shattered, when you think that they have their shit together, or you think that there's like immaculate group, but then you're either by accident or because you finally entered their inner circle, you just learn that it's all just smoke and mirrors or flying by the seat of their pants. A great example of this is the, in the book Guards Guards by Terry Pratchett, which really, if you want like fun world building shit, just read any Terry Pratchett novel. Uh, but in Guards Guards, there's a cult basically that is just a disaster. It's hysterical. Uh, they, they are all the, all the like cult members are just goobers who cannot for the life of them be a good cultist. But their cult leader is trying to accomplish something. He's trying to, I believe, resummon a dragon that that has been extinct for a long time. And so he is trying to make this thing happen. And the best that he has to work with are these jabronis, these these like absolute unworkable morons who are like complaining about the shape of the cloak and and like the hood of the cloak being too big or whatever or that there's not good enough snacks at their cult meeting uh but this guy is like this is the best i have i need to make this happen so in that case it's less <laughs> bumbling idiot more it's more inverse like he's the only one who has it together and he's just trying to make something work and because of the inad like inadequacy of his own cultists shit goes mm -hmm. haywire quite the opposite you can have a leader that people believe in that people think are are doing great or have a vision and whatnot but are just bullshitting are absolutely in over their head and are either self-serving or don't know what to do and don't have an exit strategy, which also is how some leadership in the real world works. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good point, though. And something that I had in my notes is kind of like an advanced way of thinking about your faction when you're building it is what does if your public general public is aware of the cult or the faction or whatever, what is the public opinion of them? And is it true or is it false? And mm. if so, how? And then thinking, okay, well, what do the lower member member? And then thinking, what do the lower level members of this cult believe about the cult uh, or faction or whatever? I got to stop saying cult. I just really like cults. Um, I mean, look where we are. <laughs> and then thinking about like, okay, what is a secret held within this group that only higher level people know? that could potentially devastate the faction's activities or leadership or belief in leadership, you know? Um, I believe, like, in D&D, the Xanathar Guild, like, the Thieves Guild that runs Waterdeep, people don't know that the Xanathar isn't as a beholder. Like, that's just a secret that only the highest level members of the guild know. So having something like that is a potential, like, kind of, like, angle that your party might be able to use if they come across that information. So it's a good thing to have in mind. I can bring it, I can bring it right back around to Skyrim. Because Parthenax, oh, yeah? he is the Parthenax. leader of the Greybeards and yeah. is a dragon. And they don't talk about that very much because dragon bad. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when it does come out, there is a dragon hunter clan that wants to do a big murder at him. And they want to kill Mario. And it's sad. Um, for, those who are, <laughs> for those who are not aware, we previously discussed uh, before we started recording. If you're not aware, the voice of Parthenax, the leader of the Greybeards uh, dragon boy in Skyrim, is the same guy who voices Mario. Not Chris Pratt, but Charles Martin. <laughs> it is also Mario Day. I just checked the calendar. It's March 10th. Oh, shit. Well, they're full, full circle. circle. Hey. <laughs> Look at us. We, we're good podcasters. So that good was totally planned. That was 100% planned. 100% planned. <laughs> uh, yeah, having 
the difference in public perception versus what's actually happening. Either the public trusting a group that they really shouldn't trust, the public not mm -hmm. trusting a group that has no reason to not be trusted, or, yeah, having a huge secret that you're just sitting on, and if it came out, it would completely undermine the entirety of your faction. To a lesser degree, um, again, that same faction that I was talking about that uh, <laughs> the person was excited that they were a journeyman. <laughs> on the outside of that faction, they look like they're just kind of like providing a service for people. Like, they're just kind of doing mundane tasks. They're basically like a hire, hireable gophers. Like, they're just, you can go have them do things. But in reality, that gives them the affordance to be everywhere all the time. Because they are so prevalent and because they are so helpful and useful, that means that virtually every other faction relies on them and trusts them and thinks that they're just chilling and doing neutral tasks. But that gives them tendrils everywhere. It gives them eyes and ears. It gives them insight into what everyone else is doing. And when you are a broker of information, you are powerful. And so having these ulterior motives that are not extreme, right? Like they aren't sitting on, we are... We have a doomsday device that we're going to deploy eventually. No, they're just sitting on the longer people continue to use our services, the more we can establish ourselves as fundamentally necessary. And if they try to pull away, we've got them where we want them. So we don't need to do it so yet. Cool. We're not doing it. But if we need to, we can fuck you up. And that's that's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Factions that are that that seem neutral, but are still self-serving. Like factions, at the end of the day, they exist because they are trying to continue to exist. They don't just exist for funsies. They have a goal. That goal is usually exist and usually grow. Yeah, a hundred percent. And the other beautiful thing about this, like we're gonna have an episode about cities and towns and 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 like political boundaries and like whatnot. But factions can span past all of that. They can be everywhere. And they can be a, a villain that can chase you quite literally to the ends of the world. They can... Uh, just as much as seeing that painting in a tavern somewhere might bring you calm because you know that the tavern is run by someone who you trust. If you're aware, if you learn that that painting means that they're a part of some group and it's the group that's actively hunting you. And this tavern mm -hmm. owner has been strangely nice and comped your drinks for free, maybe. And then yeah. as you're taking a sip, you notice the painting. Horrifying. Suddenly so you're bad. using all this unspoken like signage and the, the, the tendencies of this faction to just ever so slightly hint at danger. I love shit like that that's hidden in plain sight. It's just, mm, it's such good world building. It's it's a lot different when you can't run away from your problem. It's a lot different when you can't just flee the country. <laughs> I think the last thing I want to say about leaders, uh, as far as like leaders for factions go, is I'm also a big fan of introducing them, depending on the depending on the faction, introducing them very nonchalantly. Like if it's a merchant's guild leader or a you know, some other relatively mundane, you know, on the outside looks mundane. They could very much just be at some meeting somewhere. They could very much just be out and about seemingly just a normal ass person. If we're not working <laughs> with cult, like massive secret cult or super military operation where like you would never just see the admiral of the ages just walking through the town square. But if it's a still significant but less intense faction making their leadership seem accessible is super super interesting one it's a hook oh, yeah. it's it, it makes you feel as though you can approach that guild but two it gives a lot of options if you learn that hey the leader of a massive faction is just some dude and you know frequents this spot you can you can tail them you can learn their patterns you can potentially i don't know kidnap them i didn't say it I didn't say it. Who said that? Who said kidnap? I didn't. <laughs> you open up the opportunity of like, look, they are just as vulnerable as anyone else. Or why are they making themselves so vulnerable? 
That seems a little suspicious. Either way, it opens up questions, it opens up opportunities, and it, it demystifies the faction quite a bit. It humanizes them and makes them feel within reach rather than some sort of omniscient power that is way out of anyone's ability to wrangle with. If you can just see, oh, hey, yeah, that person that you just talked to, that's the leader of the Merchants Guild, Stanley Merchant. That's that's him. That's him. That's old Stanley. Stan Merchant. We we love him. He's a bit bit cranky sometimes, but going forward, here's something you guys can can wrap up and take home with you. The full on like lessons learned doggy from bag. this episode of the Atlas Loom. Hmm? A doggy bag of of the doggy wisdom. bag of of knowledge and uh, wisdom, and definitely not Diana fumbling uh, last minute last night to come up with things to say for this episode that she doesn't generally like to i fucking hate factions but when i build them I here are the questions i try and answer right what is their name what is their dogma or guiding principle um you know what beliefs do they hold dear you know what do they try and hold themselves to which doesn't necessarily have to be the same as their goal you know a faction might have a goal of trying to eradicate a rival religion but in the meantime they still have like this dogma of adherence to a code or always bowing down to whoever the leader is uh, kind of like those little smaller ideals that they that is part of their culture you know so thinking about that thinking about what happens if that code is broken if they punish people who decide to break the rules a little bit or if they just like full-on throw them out without question do they execute them what happens there do they lose their powers for the case of like a paladin who falls out of favor with their god or is an oath breaker um, you also want to think about their symbol, something that can visually distinguish them from other groups. And also, how is it displayed? Do they have a patch on their armor? Do they have like a little inscription on their weaponry? Do they have a brand or a tattoo or something? Uh, thinking about what colors they wear. So the colors of that faction, maybe they always wear purple and black, and that's like what their symbol's colors are. Um, and then in addition, kind of related to that is what do they wear? So do they wear robes that are purple and black? Do they have like bright yellow clothing all the time? Do they just stick to a certain range of colors? Also, what do they wear if they're trying to be incognito? If it's a faction that, you know, they want to operate undercover, but they still need to display something that is related to their faction and like basically tells other people like, hey, I'm safe, but in a very subtle sort of way, how do they accomplish that? You also want to think about signature spells or weaponry that they use. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be super strict. This one's kind of optional, but I like to make it so that certain religious groups or things like that always use, you know, the holy weapon of their god. So if they're followers of a god of harvest, for example, they all use sickles and that's like their main weapon. Um, or maybe their spells have like one signature spell that they prefer to use and it always looks a certain color or it looks a certain way flavor wise. Um, I have you can a, also talk I've got a fun okay. one there if I can interject real quick like one of my favorite yeah, uh, signatures from a faction was they the poison that they put on their weaponry had a oh. distinct sweet smell to it and would oh, linger that's cool. and so if you could smell that that meant that they were here either recently or they're approaching yeah it's flavor and then it's clues yeah. you know if you're tuned in you know what to look for um some of the things you want to think about are the assets that they have, which we touched on earlier. So are there any skills that everyone in this group is particularly good at? Are they all really knowledgeable, high intelligence type people? As far as other assets go, do they have certain people that they control or have access to? Do they have like the leaders of a certain city under their thumb due to blackmail? That counts as an asset. Do they have certain knowledge like lore? Um, for instance, you know, with Skyrim, they have those guys that can read the Elder Scrolls. I forget their name. They're related to like a moth or something, I think. But like, it makes you blind if you read an Elder Scroll or some such. But like, you have that it, it, it doesn't feel great when you do it. <laughs> um, it could also just be physical resources. So, you know, maybe you control certain coal mines across the, the country and that's like your thing. And that's the hold that you have on the country. Um, or if it's political, maybe you just control land. And that's your whole thing is you're trying to keep this land under your power under your control and you're constantly fighting for border uh you know border control with other people maybe i shouldn't use the term border control what's that term yeah, when you're trying to like <laughs> um when you're trying or maybe they control certain type of tracts of land and you're trying to make sure that other factions don't encroach upon that it's a way better way of putting that um 
Another thing you can think about flavor-wise is the greetings that they use with each other. How do they recognize each other when they're incognito? Do they say like a certain key word or do they have a certain just like phrase that they use to say? It's like, what's your fantasy version of Aloha, you know? Hail and well met. <laughs> Hail and well met, blessed be, things like that. We also talked about communication, uh, whether they communicate with certain symbols or codes. Um, and also just like day to day, how do they communicate? Do they use animal messengers? Do they use spells to communicate? Do they use letters with invisible ink? Like the actual physical means is also something that you could think about. Um, you also want to think about, like we talked about, the names for the different levels in the hierarchy, how big the group is. And so how big the overall hierarchy is, that little pyramid we talked about earlier. Um, the different titles that you could gain as a player as you go up in rank without thinking about like, you know, because there's the the leaders themselves, you know, you could have someone who's the high priestess or whatever, but like everyone at their level is considered like a council member or something like that. Um, so thinking about the titles that you could have as you go up in rank, who the current leader is, who their current advisors are, and also how you get to be in that role, like we talked about earlier, the succession part of it. And then, of course, the real big one is what does the guild do for the player? Because if your guild isn't doing shit for the player, even as an enemy, not even just as an ally, but if they don't have any impact on your players at all, why are they there? You know, you really want to breathe life into them by making sure that they provide something like friends or allies. Or maybe if you're a part of this guild, you get room and board. You have access to info, to secrets. You can go shopping for things that you can't otherwise get in this country. You have fences. Um, maybe this gives you connections to people who are outside the faction that you wouldn't normally be able to talk to. Or you can get an audience with a certain person. Um, maybe they move you in and out of cities under the radar. They can bail you out of jail. Or maybe you gain automatic entry to events and things like that that are exclusive to that guild. And then, of course, if you want to get real fancy with it, you know, for a bit of extra credit, you can think about what secrets that only the top members of this order have. So something that could destroy the guild if it got out. You also want to think about maybe what their weaknesses might be. If you have their assets, what do they lack? What do they want? Thank you, Diana. That was a lot of really wonderful questions. Super appreciate it. And speaking of wonderful questions, we've got some wishes to answer. As a reminder, if you would ever like to have a question answered on the podcast, you can email us at wish at the atlasloom.com. That is wish at the atlasloom.com. Send us your question. Let us know your name and pronouns so that we can talk about you and answer your question. And it's going to be great. We've got two for you here today. The first one that we've got here comes from Paul, who uses he, him pronouns. And Paul asks, what is the best way that I can DM for any age group? Paul has a situation on his hands where it seems like he might be doing a come on in, join the fun, children of any age, come play some sort of tabletop game for this event. How can we do that? I love that you pose this question to two sterile people who vocally uh, do not deal with children. However, I will do my best to answer. I will preface whatever I say just with the fact that there are probably a lot of other uh, content creators, I know I've seen them on TikTok especially, who talk about this specific thing, so don't take whatever we say as gospel. Please also talk to people who actually do this. But right off the bat, my beginning advice is, first of all, um, look up modules that are specific to certain age groups. There are people out there who have written modules that are less mature, that might be a little less combat heavy or a little more combat heavy, depending on what your your players want. And you should ask them what they want to. This is, goes for anyone DMing for any age group. Figure out what your players want and then deliver that. If you've got a bunch of six-year-olds who are like, I want to role play as a pretty princess, you should give them that. Um, don't try and like mush them into a wild sheep chase type module, uh, which isn't what they want. They're going to get bored and we want to spark that love of role playing and creativity. So uh, making sure that they're invested from the start by looking for a module that appeals to them is good. I would also say... Do your best, and this might be difficult depending on your situation and just how many kids we're dealing with here, but try not to mix age groups. Uh, I say this as someone who was a child once, and mm. as a child, fucking hated other children, especially ones who weren't at my maturity level. And if you try and throw 12-year-olds at the same table as 6-year-olds or 8-year-olds at the same table as 6-year-olds even, really anything more than a couple years age difference, the maturity gain in those couple of years is going to make it so that they can't relate to each other and the cohesiveness at the table is not going to be super fun. You know, you're going to have younger ones getting distracted, which is fine. But if there are older ones who are there who don't like that, it's 
not going to be fun for anyone. And that includes you. Um, also, just be prepared to really go with the yes and thing, right? Because people are going to get distracted. They're going to want to go off the rails. That happens more often with children than it does uh, with adults at the table, as you can imagine. And so being able to kind of like think on your feet and go with whatever story they want to tell, that always is the case for being a GM at any level for, you know, at, at all, but especially so for children. Um, so I would just say keep those points in mind as best you can. One hundred percent, doubling down, super endorso on what you just said at the end there. Like, do, I would say do less prep, right? Like, yeah. don't don't try to have a story. Let them run it. Like, just let them take it and run. All you are there for is to remind them that they're playing a game, and tell them to roll a die every once in a while, and maybe like continue the story on their behalf. On the topic of dice, though, for little, little children, I would highly recommend looking into spinners rather than dice, like a thing to flick that has, you know, one through six on it or whatever, rather than dice. Yeah. One, choking hazard. Two, they won't constantly throw it off the table. Like, if it's a spinner on the table, it won't be constantly thrown across the room. Uh, so, yeah, be thoughtful about that. But definitely uh, let them drive the story. Don't try to force them into any one thing literally sit down with no expectation and like maybe a theme and ask them what they want to do and let them drive yeah. it because the kids kids are creative as hell and if there's not if there's not a great idea <laughs> among the kids like you can seed one or maybe one of them will come up with something and the rest of them are going to immediately pounce on that i will also say on the topic of like materials and things like that go to goodwill right and cannibalize other games take the spinner from life mm -hmm. and take like that little tap thing from boggle a bunch of other games have it that are you know designed for kids small pieces that can't get lost super easily just take those and convert your system to simpler numbers in that manner um to kind of take out the math and also make sure that it's it's fun you know you can even have just the fact that you have those two alone you have something that you kind of slam as a button in order to roll dice and then a spinner like that is fun for yeah. kids to do um not a bad plan and again, this goes for every age group, but snacks. 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 The most important part of DD. Dude, my audience tried to get me to go to a uh, snack convention saying that I uh, that it's tangentially relevant to being mm -hmm. a TTRPG content creator. 100%. I almost did it for the bit. <laughs> That's a hell of a bit. <laughs> yeah. Applying as a creator. Thank God, you so, so much for the question, Paul. I hope that that gave any kind of information, but uh, seek additional sources. Yes. Our next question comes from Jake Astounding, who uses he, him pronouns, and says, in Thanks. short, thank you for the summary. In short, how can I make <laughs> a war slash conflict that is far away still feel like a real threat or a real thing to my players? And should I even try to make them care about it? I mean, first of all, my initial question is, why should they care? If it's a very far away war and a very far away threat, is it something that like kind of encroaching upon them that's like actively headed their direction and that's why they need to care first off um i, I would kind of turn it around and at, like have you ask yourself that question and be like okay well is it story relevant or will it become story relevant and if not maybe don't worry about it too much you know they don't have to care if it's not happening immediately um that being said there will still be effects and maybe that's what you should focus on in the meantime is if there's a war happening in a different country and you can think about this in terms of what happens in real life too how is it affecting this country or this region um, perhaps the things that that country normally supplies is no longer available. Um, that country is war-torn and impassable, so you can't go through that area anymore. You have to go around, and that disrupts travel or, you know, might make things inaccessible. You know, if something like food would normally travel through that area to get to wherever you're living— and it's not preserved well enough to make an entire journey around that zone, all of a sudden, you don't have that thing anymore. Um, That'd be a good one. If you really want them to care, you can also integrate it into their backstory a little bit. Maybe one of your characters was an ex-soldier or they have a soldier background um, and you can make it so like they have personal investment because it's their friends, family, brothers, whoever, uh, ex-partners, something like that, that are involved in the conflict. And maybe they're getting letters every now and then from the front lines uh, or maybe they might get recalled, uh, you know, kind of like brought back in to fight in that war. On a similar note, you can also maybe make it so that the war is fought over a value that one of your players holds dear, and maybe they have like certain opinions on one side of it or the other. Like it is related to them by their virtues or their ideals. 
So kind of integrating things in the world in with your players' backstories is a really easy way to kind of make any player care about anything. I 100% yes, having pre-existing tethers into those faraway spaces. However difficult that might be to, to sort of like create or, or weave for the background of a given character, it's worth it. Um, I love the notion of goods that are no longer coming in. There can also be physical effects depending on how how bloody how significant this war is what kind of tools are being used in it if there's magic being used that is the kind of magic that's not touched unless there is some significant threat to the entirety of the stability of a kingdom because it's got grave consequences those consequences might bleed outside of the kingdom itself maybe there are fissures coming out of the ground just like suddenly there's just like lava or like a new volcano or mountain there's like appears if that kind of effect is doable in your world having this war affecting a larger area either physically economically whatever that's how you do it that or you just have a bunch of npcs talking about it have npcs that they meet who are off to go fight in that war or mercenaries that are upcharging because they've already got a contract to go fight in that war and so now they're there's like a lack of mercenaries and so local bandits are running wild like yeah any number of downstream effects jake i hope that helps uh I, and also the other option is don't say anything about the war let them have to discover it and if they don't pay attention to the obvious giant war that's going on and then they are <laughs> affected by the obvious giant war that's going on it sounds like it's on them honestly yeah Thank you again to everyone who submitted today. Once more, if you guys are looking to have some questions answered with regards to mechanics, world building, anything along those lines, even if it's above the table stuff, you can let us know and we will do our best to answer in an episode. Again, you can send those into wish at theatlasloom.com. That's W-I-S-H at theatlasloom.com. Now we're going to hop into some announcements. Other than the massive merch thing that we talked about at the very beginning of this episode, um, we do have a very special event coming up at the end of the month, which is... PAX East. PAX East. Dev and I are going to be out to Boston here in a couple, God, I think like like when couple this weeks. episode comes out, is going to be, we're going to be there later that week, right? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, we are going to be wandering the con floor. We don't have a panel for the Atlas Slim quite yet, but if you see us wandering around, regardless, feel free to come say hi. We'd love talking to you guys. On those same lines, whenever we go to a con, we do try and do a little Gilded World Weaver exclusive episode where Dev and I sit down and debrief about how certain events went. We did one for PAX Unplugged, which for the Gilded World Weavers who didn't see that, you can head to the website and see that right now because it has been up for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And we'll try and do one for PAX East as well. So check that out. If you're not a Gilded World Weaver yet, you can unlock that for $5 a month on our site or $50 a year uh, and gain access to everything that we've done as a bonus episode retroactively. So just at this point, probably hours worth of content mm -hmm. uh, that is mostly Dev and I just riffing <laughs> and just joking around and having a good time. So check that out. Thank you guys so much again for listening. I have been Diana Fay, better known as Diana of the Rose. I'm a TTRPG content creator over on Twitch and TikTok, teaching people how to do better as DMs, as players, how to get into games for the first time, how to use DIY sort of skills. It's it's kind of like a short form version of the Atlas Loom, if I'm being fully honest. So I am at Diana of the Rose on all platforms. You can also check me out as an actual play performer. And hopefully the past and future uh, co-host of this this here podcast. I certainly hope so. Please don't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm still not your boss. <laughs> How about you, Dev? Where can people find you? Hello. My name is Endeavorance, also known as simply Dev. You can find everything that I do at endeavorance.camp. I am on TikTok. I am on Twitch. I am in places. Um... Recently launched the merch store, shop.endeavorance.camp. You can find my merch as well as Atlas Loom merch there. There's a lot of fun stuff, more stuff <laughs> over time to check out often. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Atlas Loom. Our paths will cross again soon, but in the meantime, keep on weaving your worlds. Bye-bye. <laughs>